picked up an excerpt from uh, uh, Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel. Uh, it's one of my favorite books. It's a Pulitzer winner, but uh, as far as uh, reading comprehension is concerned, this is uh, one hell of a treasure trove because of the number of ideas which are developed right across this book. And uh, it's a good opportunity for readers, especially those who are preparing for CAD, GMAT, GRE, um, competitive exams like this, specifically CAD, GMAT, and GRE. This book is awesome because it uh, gives you a lot of practice, ideas within ideas within ideas, which is what you would see in a reading comprehension passage, right? Uh, there's a big idea, which is called the main theme, obviously, across 400 to 600 words. But the big idea is com uh, comprises of multiple sub ideas. Probably each para gives you one sub idea, a few lines, sub idea, and how that sub idea influences the next one. So a good reader is uh, mostly trying to figure out what is a sub idea in a particular paragraph. Yes, what is a tone, and how does this particular argument in one para in influence the next argument, and so on and so forth. Uh, so if you look at uh, this particular excerpt that I picked, ignore the does. Uh, it's just uh, carrying from uh, forward from the uh, previous content, but we don't need to worry about that. Questions about inequality in the modern world can be reformulated as follows. So whatever follows will give me the questions about inequality, but we already have encountered uh, the major keyword, and uh, let me just put a box around it uh, so we don't uh, ignore it. See, the reason I'm, I keep putting these boxes, uh, and, and you'll see a lot of this is, uh, to reiterate that when you're reading uh, a paragraph or a passage, when you're reading a bunch of words, a bunch of sentences, it's important uh, to memorize a few words, keep them hold in your cache. Because at the end of the day, you cannot remember 550 words, obviously, you cannot remember entire sentences, entire essays. Yes. But in order to understand what is the general idea of a particular passage given to you, uh, a GMAT passage or a CAT passage, you need to at least know what were the main keywords in, uh, you know, sprinkled across the uh, passage. So here we have tools, so we'll put boxes around them, but over a period of time, you must be used to remember these words and you must be able to, you, you should, when you're look, looking at a passage, these words should literally jump out of you, right? Um, how it happened to uh, John Nash, for example, in A Beautiful Mind. It's literally, these important words should literally jump up at you. Uh, and that's how you should imagine. That's how good readers uh, remember so much more and comprehend so much more. So the questions about inequality in the modern world can be reformulated as follows. Uh, what is it? Why did wealth and power become distributed as they now are rather than in some other way? So we already know what probably is the central idea of the passage, right? The author is asking a question as to why wealth and power uh, are concentrated in certain pockets or certain chunks. So why was it distributed the way it has been distributed? For instance, why weren't Native Americans, Africans, and Aboriginal Australians the ones who decimated, subjugated, or exterminated Europeans and Asians? This is a very important sentence. Uh, because of the number of things you can learn from this, right? A, uh, if this were a reading comprehension passage, uh, you would have encountered a question uh, such as a question like, uh, why did the author speak about Native Americans, Africans, and Aboriginal Australians? What was the purpose of this example? What you would call, uh, you know, an example specific question. Uh, what is the purpose of the author mentioning Native Americans, Africans, and Aboriginal Australians? Why did the author mention it? It's there in the previous sentence, right? The bigger, so when, whenever there's a question on a specific example, you're, the answer wouldn't be the example itself, right? Because it could be any example. The purpose of the example would always be over and above this. Uh, so you have to come out of the idea of the example and see what else is there. Why did wealth and power become distributed as they now are? So in order to ask this question, the author used Native Americans, Africans, and Aboriginal Australians. Part one. Part two. The, why weren't these guys the ones who decimated, subjugated, or exterminated Europeans and nations? So what can we infer from this, uh, you know, uh, question that has asked quite indirectly, we can infer, or the author is implying that it's it, ha it was the other way around. So what actually happened is the other way around. So when the author asks, why weren't Native Americans, Africans, and Aboriginal Australians the ones who decimated, subjugated, or exterminated Europeans and nations? The author is implying that it was Europeans and Asians who had uh, decimated, subjugated, or exterminated Native Americans, Africans, and Aboriginal Australians. That's the implication. Do we know it for sure? We understand the tone of the author, so probably we can, you know, bet on the author implying this. But by its very nature, implications or inferences by the very nature are things 
you aren't 100% sure of. So as a reader, you ask the question, okay, is this what the author is trying to imply? We have evidence, right? But you do not confirm it yet, but probably the, the author is trying to say, when I ask, uh, for example, uh, why wasn't, uh, uh, why wasn't uh, country A the winner against country B uh, in this particular uh, game? Instead, if I say, meaning that I'm telling you probably B won it, all right? So, uh, the lo longer form of the same, uh, the small example is this. For instance, why were Native Americans, Africans, and Aboriginal Australians the ones who decimated, subjugated, or exterminated Europeans and nations? Mm -hmm. So, third thing you need to understand here is that if, you, if I look at this one particular paragraph uh, as a silo, there are two interesting, there are two things happening simultaneously. One, the author has established the purpose that we are going to discuss about a very important question around inequality, and that question is. Why did wealth and power get distributed the way it got distributed? The second part of the paragraph is actually not a theory sentence, it's an example sentence. The difference between theory sentence and example sentence obviously is self-explanatory, right? So it's not giving you something new. It's just elaborating on what has already been told to told you. So the second, the for instance uh, question is just reiterating what the author had already asked. This is where good readers save time and you should be saving time which is you read the question for instance why were native americans that sentence you read very fast you should read very fast because of the positive connector called for instance meaning that the tone is continuing and you read the sentence very fast because as a good reader you would have probably already understood what this example is about because the previous sentence is clear right if i understood why did wealth and power become distributed as they now are if i understood that question well i don't need to again look for information in this particular sentence so these are all the things so that you need to assimilate in your head while you're reading and see that's why reading could be challenging that's why some some guys are good readers and some guys are not good readers at the end of the day that's the effort right uh, you're trying to uh, figure out a lot of things using your skills. Um, sometimes you don't catch them, sometimes you catch them, and the faster you catch them, the faster you solve the passage, the more questions you can you know, answer. So it's important for you to separate out the types of sentences, first of all. In this particular paragraph, we have a theory sentence, we have an uh, you know, example sentence or an elaboration sentence, and these are just, this is fancy words, probably there's no such theory saying there are, you know, no such rule saying theory sentences, and uh, I mean, uh, don't imagine a PPT where you know there are two types of sentences, nothing like that. All I'm trying to say is that you have two different types of sentences. At the end of the day, every sentence is conveying information to you, right? So when you're reading it, look at it that way. So the author is asking a question, the author gave you an example. So I can, uh, as a, uh, probably if I'm a question setter, I would say, why did the author use this example? And if you're a good reader, you don't even have to come back here and double check. You know why that example was used, right? Now, uh, going down further, uh, we can, anyway, before I go there, just underline this part, right? The ones who decimated, subjugated, or exterminated. So let me just uh, put a box here so that you know this is the other idea. We can easily push this question back one step. As of the year AD 1500, when your, Europe's worldwide colonial expansion was just beginning, peoples on different continents already differed greatly in technology and political organization. Okay, uh, look at the word peoples. It might confuse a few guys, but what's the difference between people and peoples? When I refer to the word people as a group, then peoples is groups, right? So peoples meaning uh, groups of different types of people. Peoples on different continents already differed greatly in technology and political organization. Much of Europe, Asia, and North Africa was the site of metal equipped states or empires, some of them on the threshold of industrialization. So the author said that we can push this question back one step. The author goes to year 1500, the author gives you background. The author talks about colonial expansion, which is just beginning. Now, this is why, again, the connection to the previous sentence is important. Do you remember? We had understood that the author was trying to imply that Europeans and Asians who are the ones who decimated, subjugated, you know, and exterminated A, B, C. If you had caught that, this would have become very easy for you. Europe's worldwide colonial expansion was just beginning. That's the confirmation. So now I know, yes, whatever I thought the author implied was actually what the author implied. When Europe's worldwide colonial ex expansion was beginning, it becomes easier for me to understand. So I do not, even if I drift away a little bit when I come to the second paragraph, and there uh, I can still hold on to my uh, you know rather superficial reading because I've already understood or assimilated the idea in the previous paragraph. When Europe's worldwide colonial expansion was just beginning, peoples on different continents already differed greatly in technology and political organization. 
So people differed in technology and political organization. That's two, two important terms for me. Much of Europe, Asia, and North Africa was the site of metal equipped states or empires, some of them on the threshold of industrialization. Two Native American peoples, the Aztecs and the Incas, ruled over empires with stone tools. Parts of Sub-Saharan Africa were divided among small states or uh, sheepdoms with iron tools. Most other peoples, including all those of Australia and New Guyana, many Pacific Islands, much of the Americas, and small parts of Sub-Saharan Africa lived as farming tribes or even still as hunter-gatherer bands using stone tools. So, there's one important sentence and there's a lot of elaboration. So there's one important sentence you need to pay attention to while you're reading and there are a lot of sentences you are not going to try and memorize because this is too much data and you'll end up wasting time. Even if you drift away in the middle of that particular piece of information, you just move on because they're just elaboration sentences. So which part is that, right? Now look at uh, this piece here. Much of uh, peoples on different continents already differed greatly in technology and political organization. That's my idea. Much of your, now look at the distinction. The dichotomy. Much of Europe, Asia, and North Africa was a site of metal equipped states or empires, some of them on the threshold of industrialization. Can you see the link? Metal equipped states and industrialization. So the assumption is that when you are equipped with uh, metals, helps your industrialization to a certain extent. To native, um, two Native American peoples, the Aztecs and the Incas ruled over empires with stone tools. Parts of Sub-Saharan Africa were divided among small states or sheepdoms with iron tools. Most other peoples, so we have three batches here and how did they rule? Most other peoples, including all those of Australia and New Guyana, many Pacific Islands, much of the Americas, small parts of Sub-Saharan Africa lived as farming tribes or even still have hunter-gatherer bands using stone tools. So, they, so why were all these examples given? To tell you that people differed in terms of the technology they had, in terms of the political organization uh, they had. It's important for you to understand when they say technology and your vocabulary plays a major role, uh, right, in the way you understand things. You must understand that technology here is not just the technology we talk about in the modern day uh, scenario, right? Technology. Even in tools, stone tools, for example, or iron tools, for example, that, that also is part and parcel of technology. That small uh, underlying uh, essence you have to be able to understand because technology and political organization is a summary of this entire par paragraph, whatever we read later. So let's say somewhere here, parts of sub-Saharan Africa, if you drifted uh, around here and just, you, you know, you realize that probably one or two sentences just slipped by. You don't need to waste time going back and you know rereading the whole thing because we're just giving the authors is giving you examples, right? Technology and political organization was different. That's all he's trying to uh, say. Now, uh, if I go a little further. If we go a little further down, uh, of course, those technological and uh, political differences as of AD 1500 were the immediate cause of the modern world's inequalities. Uh, empires with steel weapons were able to conquer or exterminate tribes with weapons of stone and wood. How, though, did the world get to be the way it was in AD 1500? Uh, so how many ways the author has linked, right? So if you remember, in the first paragraph, uh, let me just scroll it down for you again. Uh, in the first paragraph, the author establishes the question for you uh, and says, uh, the question about inequality can be reformulated, can be rephrased, or can be mentioned differently. Why did wealth and power become distributed uh, the way they are? Let's push the, push the question a little further and say, well, at the beginning of AD 1500, this was the, uh, this was the, uh, standard, established standard, or this was how the status quo was, that some people had stone tools, some people had uh, different tools. Basically, technology and political organization was, uh, was varying across various parts of the planet. So if you notice, this particular paragraph, which starts with, we can easily push this question back one step, this particular big paragraph is one way an elaboration of this small paragraph. And just this one sentence, why did wealth and power become distributed as they now are? rather than in some other way is being elaborated in this massive paragraph here where the author says you know uh, this is what it was but and then he comes down and he explains this is what these people did this is what those people did just elaboration and elaboration and then suddenly boom the author comes here third paragraph is of course those technological and political differences as of ad 1500 were the immediate cause of the modern world's inequalities 
modern world's inequalities were because of these technological and political differences. And the author listed out those differences in the previous paragraph. And empires with steel weapons were able to conquer or exterminate tribes with weapons of stone and wood. So there was a group A and group B in the second paragraph. One group uh, prevailed over the other group. Fair, fair enough. But then the big question, how though did the world get to be the way it was in AD 1500? So how did the world get to be the way it is now? Because this is what existed in AD 1500 and some groups are already more powerful than the other groups or some people, some groups are already more advanced than uh, the other groups or had a different political organization compared to the other groups. But how did that happen? That's the next question. So can you see the author is building an argument within an argument so the layers, right? So how did this happen? Okay, let's go back a little. Uh, let's go back one step. How did AD 1500 happen? Once again, we can easily push this question back one step further. Can you see why I picked up this excerpt? Because this is how uh, GMAT or these are the kind of passages you would uh, probably see in GMAT or GRE or uh, you know in CAT because they're ideas within ideas all building into central idea. So what, what is the author asking you here now? Once again, we can easily push this question back one step further by drawing on written histories and archaeological discoveries. Until the end of the last ice age, around 11,000 BC, all peoples and all continents were still hunter-gatherers. So we have 1500 AD with this massive difference, technology and uh, political organization. But if we take a step back and, you know, go back, you know, zoom out almost and go to 11,000 BC, people across all the continents are still hunter-gatherers. So what is the, what is the um, implication here? I can understand that the author is saying whatever change happened, happened between 11,000 BC and 1500 AD. I can also infer, uh, infer that some parts of the world, some peoples never really changed from whatever they were in 11,000 BC, hunter-gatherers, but some in some parts there was massive change. Different, and see, different rates of development on different continents from 11,000 BC to AD 1500 were what led to the technological and political inequalities of AD 1500. So a really good reader doesn't need, need this sentence, different rates of development on different continents. Like we saw, we could infer it from the previous sentence itself, right? So a really good reader, infers information because you ask so many questions and there's always underlying information and you ask the right questions. So this particular sentence is just a confirm confirmation of whatever I had inferred from the sentence until the end of the last year, that, that particular sentence. So I'll just zoom past the sentence really quickly. So, so reading fast is not just about how many words you can go on. I mean, the speed readers do that, right? They read uh, really fast, they finish entire books, I don't know, in one or two hours whatever. Uh, that's one part of speed reading. And I know there's a lot of content uh, online that will tell you how to read fast, how to consume more information. But doing reading comprehension fast does, doesn't need you to be a speed reader. You don't have to. Yes, it's good if you can read the 300, 350 words per minute, probably touch 400. Uh, but if you have about 150 to 200 words per minute and a decent memory and grasp of the language, you can save time in not rereading certain pieces of information because you are connecting the dots. So from one sentence, I could already understand different rates of development is coming. It's there in the previous sentence, right? Now, uh, what led to the technological and political inequalities of AD 1500? While Aboriginal Australians and many Native Americans remain hunter-gatherers, most of Eurasia and much of the Americas and Sub-Saharan Africa gradually developed agriculture, herding, metallurgy, complex political organization. More elaboration, right? Just zoom past all this. Parts of Eurasia and one area of the Americas independently developed writing as well. One more aspect added to the technology. Again, writing was also part of the technology. You'll have to understand that. However, that's that's one of my favorite words and you should always um, please 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 take note of uh, sentences like uh, words like these it's called a contrast marker you have words like these however but nevertheless nonetheless a lot of words uh, like that we'll keep discussing them when when they pop up into our passages and excerpts but why is why is however so important shift of the tone right so parts of Eurasia and one area of the americas independently developed writing somebody else heard something else however each of these new developments appeared earlier in eurasia than elsewhere this happened this happened this happened cool However, we should note that new developments appeared earlier in Eurasia than elsewhere. For instance, the mass production of bronze tools, which was just beginning in the South American Andes in the centuries before AD 1500, was already established in parts of Eurasia over 4,000 years earlier. 
over 4,000 years earlier, the stone technology of the Tasmanians, when first encountered by European explorers in AD 1642, was simpler than that prevalent in parts of Upper Paleolithic Europe uh, tens of thousands of years earlier. Thus, we can finally rephrase the question about the modern world's inequalities as follows. Why did human development proceed at such different rates on different continents? Those disparate rates con constitute history's broadest pattern and my book subject. Right. So we will stop this particular excerpt here. Uh, I mean, probably if it interests you, you can always uh, look up uh, for this book and then uh, read read a little bit from it or buy it properly. Uh, it's called Guns, Germs and Steel uh, with Jared Diamond. But you can see what is happening here, right? First paragraph, the author asks a question. Last paragraph, the author asks a question. And they are similar questions, but there are connections. And the author says, okay, I want to ask a question about inequality. I want to talk about a time period called AD 1500 AD when, uh, sorry, AD 1500, when these guys had these kinds of, these differences in terms of technology and uh, political organization. I want to take a step further and tell you that a little uh, further back, 11,000 BC, people are all similar, hunters, hunter gatherers mostly, but then the, the difference started popping up and then some guys developed technology, some guys had metallurgy, other guys didn't have, some guys developed uh, writing, all this happened and the difference is popping up. And so we need to ask a question, why did human development proceed at such different rates on different continents? But before we stop this, the big point, right, the, uh, you know, is what you need to observe. Uh, is the author's use of two keywords and when the author jumps keywords you need to understand that the author expects you to understand that he or she is connecting those two keywords right what are these two keywords here again let me uh, draw boxes for you here this part why did human development proceed at such different rates on uh, different rates on different contents so the last question became, why did human development proceed at such different rates on different continents, right? If I scroll up um, to the first, first part of the, of the passage, what was the question uh, that was originally asked by the author, uh, if you remember? Questions about inequality in the modern world can be reformulated as follows. Why did wealth and power become distributed as they now are? Right, so why did wealth and power become distributed the way they, were, they are? And we are talking about human development later, uh, right? And then we are talking about technological and political differences and how though the world, how though did the world get to be the way it was in 1500 AD? So, so multiple questions being asked, right? How did people on different continents differ so greatly in technology and political organization? So technology and political organization, inequality, uh, different peoples, human development, the author is connecting all these things. And as a reader, these are the things that you need to be paying attention to. Uh, thanks for listening. Until next time.